Today, we're going to go into the book of Joshua. Um, we've given these Torah portions names. Okay, the, the names of the Torah portions are all traditional. They come from the first few lines of the section of text. So today it's going to be Vayomer, which means, and it came to be. And it, it brings up an interesting question as to what exactly is the Torah? What exactly is a portion of the Torah? And there are several different answers that we could come up with. Um, we kind of have in our head when we think of what is the Torah, we think it's the first five books of the Bible. And that's not actually correct. It is correct and it's not correct. That is part of the Torah. Um, it's what the Jews would call the Torah. They would say, well, that's the law. That's the first five books. It's the books of Moses. So that's the Torah. Yeshua had a different idea about what the Torah was. He included the prophets and the writings in the Bible, in the Torah, because Torah means teaching and instruction, basically. So whether this should be included in a Torah portion is an interesting question. Now, if we were to narrow down to the law, the prophets, and the writings, that would be the Torah, the prophets, and the writing. That's where you get the word Tanakh from. You've got the, the Torah, the Navi, which, or the Naviim, which would be the prophets, um, and the Ketavim, which would be the, uh, the writings. And from that, you get Tanakh. But if we're actually looking what the law po portion of that is, what is the Torah part, then we can actually include Joshua within that itself, just in the Torah part of it. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I was to ask you who wrote the Torah, I think most people would probably say that Moses wrote the Torah. But as it turns out, that might not be exactly correct. It is known as the Torah of Moshe, it's also known as the Torah of Elohim. So it was Elohim's Torah, which he gave to Moshe, and Moshe taught the Torah. But does that mean that he actually wrote the Torah and all of the Torah? Deuteronomy 34, 5 to 8 says, And Moshe, the servant of Yehovah, died there in the land of Moab, according to the mouth of Yehovah. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, and no one knows his burial place to this day. And Moshe was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his freshness gone. And the children of Israel wept for Moshe in the desert plains of Moab 30 days. So this is written in the Torah. It could be that Yehovah inspired Moshe to write this before his death. But this is talking about what happened after Moshe's death, and it records these events. So there's also a likelihood there that somebody else wrote this and recorded it. Okay, it's recorded as in these events are the ones that happen. In Joshua 8, 30 to 32, it says, And Yehoshua, Joshua, built an altar to Yehovah Elohim of Israel in Mount Eval. As Moshe, the servant of Yehovah, had commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the Torah of Moshe. Okay, so we've got the book of the Torah of Moshe, the book which contains the Torah of Moshe. An altar of unhewn stones over which no man has wielded iron. And they offered it on they offered on it burnt offerings to Yehovah and slaughtered peace offerings. And there in the presence of the children of Israel, he wrote on the stones, uh, this is Joshua, Joshua wrote on the stones a copy of the Torah of Moshe, which he had written. Okay, so it tells us here that Joshua 
wrote the Torah of Moshe and that he wrote a copy of it on these stones. So if we're to ask who does the Bible say wrote the Torah of Moshe, the answer would be Joshua. Now Joshua, son of Nun, Moshe's assistant from his youth. Okay, so Joshua was his assistant. Exodus 33 verse 11 says, Thus Yehovah spoke to Moshe face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Okay, in the tent of meeting, this is where Yehovah would speak to Moshe. And he would return to the camp. Moshe would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, son of Nun, a young man, did not leave the tent. Okay, so when he spoke to Moshe face to face, Moshe would go back to the camp and Joshua would stay in the tent. And the scriptures tell us Joshua wrote the Torah of Moshe. Now in John 5, it says, For if you believed Moshe, you would have believed me since he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how shall you believe my words? So that could seem like a fairly cut and dry case. Who wrote the Torah? Moshe wrote. If you do not believe his writings, okay? Jeremiah 36, 1 to 4. I think it's more than 1 to 4, actually, that I've covered here. Um, it says, I came to be in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Yoshiahu, king of Yehudah, that this word came to Yirmiyahu, to Jeremiah, from Yehovah. So this is what Yehovah says to Jeremiah. Take a scroll and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel, against Yehudah, and against all the nations from the day I spoke to you, from the days of Yoshiahu, even to this day. So he's commanded, I want you to write on this scroll. It could be that the house of Yehudah hears of all the evil which I plan to bring upon them, so that each one turns back from his evil way, and I shall pardon their crookedness and their sin. And Yirmiyahu called Baruch, son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote on a scroll from the mouth of Yirmiyahu all the words of Yehovah which he'd spoken to him. So he's told, you, write this on a scroll. How does he do that? He gets Baruch, his assistant, his scribe to do it. And Yirmiyahu commanded Baruch saying, I am shut up, I am unable to enter the house of Yehovah. But you shall enter and shall read from the scroll which you have written from my mouth, the words of Yehovah and the hearing of the people in the house of Yehovah on the day of fasting. And also read them in the hearing of all Yehuda who came from the cities. In verse 10 it says, And Baruch, Baruch read from the book the words of Yirmiyahu in the house of Yehovah, in the room of Gemiyahu, son of Shaphan the scribe. Okay, in the hearing of all the people. So he's the one who writes it. Commanded by Yehovah, write these things, but Baruch is the one who writes it. Jeremiah 36, 27 to 28 says, And after the king had burned the scroll with the words which Baruch had written from the mouth of Yemiyahu, so he wasn't very happy, and he, he burns this scroll when he hears what's prophesied. The word of Yehovah came to Yemiyahu again, saying, Take another scroll and write on it. Okay, so Yehovah recognizes here that in what Yemiyahu did, in getting Baruch to write the scroll, he had taken a scroll and written upon it. And he says, I want you to do it again. I want you to take another scroll and write upon it. Yirmiyahu took another scroll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, son of Neriyahu, who wrote on it from the mouth of Yirmiyahu all the words of the book. So he writes it out again. We've got a similar situation with Moshe and Joshua, don't we? He's his assistant. He's said to have written the book. So when it says Moshe wrote this, it doesn't exclude the possibility. Now, something else as well. The word which means to write, okay, when we, 
when we hear it in English, write, we think of the verb to write something down. That's what he did. It says it very plainly. They were his writings. He wrote it. But the word also means to record. The Hebrew and the Greek words both mean to write something, the actual physical act of writing, and also to record something. So when it says write on this scroll, take another scroll and write these words, it can be take another scroll and record these words. Moshe's writings, and when it says he wrote, it can be Moshe recorded these things, so it can be by the hand of Joshua. So Philip found Nethanael and said to him, we have found him who Moshe in the Torah and the prophets did write or did record. Yeshua of Nazareth, the son of Yosef. Okay, so Moshe in the Torah. You've got the Torah of Moshe, and that's distinct from the prophets sometimes, but sometimes they're all recorded as uh, the Torah as one. In Luke 24, uh, 44, Yeshua says to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all have to be fulfilled that were written in the Torah of Moshe, that's Moshe's Torah, his teaching, and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. So that's those three categories. It's the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. In John 10, Yeshua answered them, is it not written in your own Torah? I said, you are Elohim. So when we read this, if we've got that narrow, traditional Jewish understanding of what the Torah is, we just think it's the first five books of the Bible, and we'd say, well, where is it in the Torah that says, I said, you are Elohim? Because it's in fact Psalm 82. Okay, I said, you are Elohim. So Yeshua refers to them individually, the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms. Here, he refers to the Psalms as part of the Torah. So you've got the Torah of Moshe, the book of the Torah of Moshe, the prophets, and the writings. And you can refer to all of them as Torah, because Torah doesn't just mean law. It means Yehovah's teaching. You could call the New Testament the Torah equally. John 12, 34 says, The crowd answered him, We have heard out of the Torah that the Messiah remains forever. And how do you say the son of Adam has to be lifted up? Who is this son of Adam? So the crowd say, We've heard out of the Torah that the Messiah remains forever. Problem is, the Torah doesn't say that the Messiah remains forever. Then they say, who is this son of Adam? The Greek word used there is anthropos. It's man. Okay, who is this son of man? In Hebrew, there's a couple of different words that can mean man. There's Adam. Adam can either mean Adam. The name Adam can mean mankind or it can mean a man. You can have ish, that's a man, an ish. You can also have enosh. Enosh can mean man, and it can mean a man. The part of scripture that they're referring to here is actually from the prophets. Daniel seven thirteen to 14 says, I was looking in night visions and saw one like the son of enosh, so the son of man. In the Septuagint, that is the son of Anthropos, okay? Doesn't have to be Ad Adam. In that English translation, they've put the son of Adam. That just means son of man in Hebrew, okay? Son of Enosh also means son of man in Hebrew, and that's a son of Anthropos in the Greek. Coming with the cloud of the heavens, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And to him was given rulership, and preciousness and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His rule is an everlasting rule. So this is the son of Anthropos who remains forever. And this is a scripture from the prophets. So we see the writings, the prophets, the Torah of Moshe, or the book of the Torah, all referred to 
as Torah. So Joshua, who wrote the book of the Torah of Moshe, his later writings would also be included in this. In Joshua 24, verse 26, that tells us, this is right at the end of the book of Joshua, when Joshua is old. It says, then Joshua wrote these words in the book of the Torah of Elohim. Again, the Torah of Elohim, the Torah of Moshe, they're one and the same. Just like when we hear Elohim did something, and we also hear that Hasatan did the same thing. And that's reconciled because Hasatan did something and Yehovah did it through him, so to speak. Yehovah's Torah is Moshe's Torah. People get very confused thinking, well, we don't follow the law of Moses anymore. And they get, try to distinguish it from God's law. But Elohim gave his law to Moshe. So it's simultaneously his law and Moshe's law. But Joshua wrote all of those words in the book of the Torah of Elohim. This is at the end of the book of Joshua. He wrote the book of the Torah, including Moshe's death. And then he records all the words which we're going to study in the book of the Torah. So is Joshua the Torah portion? I would say yes. Luke 24 verse 27. Beginning at Moshe and all the prophets, he was explaining to them all the scriptures concerning himself. Okay, so this is Yeshua. He's on the road to Emmaus and he's explaining who he is after his death. They've heard all these things about him. He's explaining who he is and his death and all of those sorts of things from Moshe and the prophets, beginning there and explaining all the things. Because all of the scriptures point to Yeshua, all of them explain the gospel and that's something that i'm going to be focusing on in the joshua torah portions this one and the next one there's going to be four torah portions i'm going to do this one if you see charlie the next i'll do one and charlie will do the last joshua torah portion what i'm going to be focusing on is the gospel the gospel throughout the scriptures and what the gospel actually is what is the good news why is it necessary that we believe that Yeshua died and was raised again? Why is that necessary to believe? I'll go through all of that. I'll go through that particularly next time. I'll be going through a lot to do with the good news, with the gospel throughout these Torah portions. John 5, 46 to 47. Again, if you believe Moshe, you would have believed me since he wrote about me. If you do not believe his writings, how shall you believe my words? My words are the same thing. So we go back in the Torah, we see pictures of Yeshua. We see people who particularly are pictures of Yeshua. We see it with Joseph, don't we? We've looked at Joseph before. In this teaching, I would recommend to anybody to watch this because this goes through Joseph's life chronologically and shows how it is the narrative in the Gospels chronologically. Joseph gets things backwards to how Messiah gets them, but his life is chronologically Messiah's life. And that's going all the way back to the book of Genesis. Okay, Yeshua is written about within there. We see Aaron. Okay, Aaron is a picture of Yeshua, isn't he? Not only because he is high priest, we also get other things with Aaron that are a picture of Yeshua. Okay, think of his rod that budded. Right from the beginning, we have this idea of life coming from death. And it's all the way through. And this is essential for us to understand, to understand the gospel as it is taught from Genesis through all of the Torah of Elohim, including the New Testament. Okay, Daniel. In the book of Daniel, we see Daniel cast into a pit, don't we? With the lions. Okay. This is, again, a story of where Daniel was put in a situation where he was certain to die. He wasn't 
killed and then resurrected to life, but he was put in a situation where he was certain to die. He was, uh, it was seen as a form of execution, wasn't he? He was told that he would be executed by being thrown to the lions. He was thrown to the lions, and yet he comes out alive. He comes out of the pit alive. Yeshua went down to Sheol dead and came out alive. So this is a picture of Yeshua. Joseph in his life, okay, Joseph was twice in a pit brought out to life. First time his brothers threw him in the pit, okay, and instead of killing him, they sold him into slavery. So he was put in a situation where he was to die and he came out to life. Also, he was thrown in the dungeon, wasn't he, in, um, in Egypt and he was brought out and he wasn't just brought out to live, he was brought out to be, um, to be ruler. Jonah is the, uh, the picture that Yeshua talks about. He says, no sign shall be given to you except the sign of the prophet Jonah, who was in the fish's stomach for three days. Okay, if you get swallowed by a fish, a giant fish, you're going to die because stomachs have acid in them and you would be digested if you were swallowed by a giant fish. Jonah was swallowed. He was put in a situation where he would have died, but his life was preserved and he came out alive. So again, this is a picture of Yeshua. Moses, okay, Moses was hidden. He was supposed to die. Okay, all of the, the firstborn males were to die, but he was hidden. And what we see with Jonah is he was hidden for three days, just like Yeshua was in the heart of the earth for three days. And when we see this number three around these sorts of events, it's a bit of a hint that we're going to see something messianic. All of these events that we've seen, in fact, involve the number three. Moses, he was hidden for three moons. The woman conceived and bore a son, and she saw that he was a lovely child, and she hid him three moons. Okay, so exactly this picture of Yeshua, the number three is involved. Death, or um, certain death, changing to life. Genesis 14, 9 to 13, with Joseph when he's in the dungeon. So the chief cupbearer related this dream to Joseph, said to him, see in my dream, a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, like Aaron's rod. Its blossoms shot forth, its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, so I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And Yosef said to him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Yet within three days, again, Pharaoh is going to lift up your head and restore you to your place. Okay, with the baker, the baker was going to die. The cup bearer within three days was going to be restored to his place. So again, we've got this picture of Yeshua and we've got the number three which accompanies it. It's not always the number three. Sometimes it's the number 30. Sometimes it's the number 3,000, but three is involved. In Numbers 20, 29, it says, when all the congregation saw that Aharon was dead, okay, the high priest had died, all the house of Israel wept for Aharon 30 days. And you might think, well, that's just a period of mourning. It's not. The periods of mourning that we see throughout the scriptures are all different. Joseph was mourned for 40 days, for example. 30 days is something which points us to the death of the high priest, Yeshua's death. Okay, Daniel. Daniel 6, 7 to 10, the reason he was thrown into the pit. All the governors of the kingdom, the nobles and viceroys, the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal decree and to make a strong interdict that whoever petitions any Allah, any God or man for 30 days, 
except you, O king, is thrown into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the interdict, sign the writing, so that it is not to be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not pass away. So King Dariavesh signed the written interdict. And Daniel, when he knew that the writing was signed, went home and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, knelt down on his knees three times a day. Okay, so the law was, if you do this, then you will die. Daniel puts himself in this situation of certain death again and again we've got the number three and what happens to him he comes out of this situation of death to life samson okay you might not think of samson as a messianic figure but he is and it's important that we understand these messianic figures because when we see messianic figures and we see links with other people what we're seeing is a link between the Messiah in somebody, and then in the other narrative, since those people are equivocated, and we'll see this, Messiah is seen in that picture as well. So with Samson, the house was filled with men and women. Okay, so this is when they uh, capture Samson and they force him to entertain them. And all the princes of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women. Okay, this is something to be aware of when you read in through the scriptures. Think of the 3,000 which became part of their number at Pentecost, or the 3,000 that were killed among the Levites. Okay. There are 3,000 men and women who were there who were on the roof, who watched Shimshon or Samson entertaining. And Shimshon called to Yehovah, saying, O Master Yehovah, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, only this time, O Elohim, and let me avenge myself on the Philistines with vengeance for my two eyes. They'd taken out his eyes, hadn't they? Shimshon took hold of the two middle columns which supported the house, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. And Shimshon said, let me die with the Philistines and he bowed himself mightily and the house fell on the princes on the 3,000 who were there. Judges 13 we get introduced to Samson okay so we've just seen what Samson's death is. In Judges 13 we see an interesting structure in the beginning of Judges 13 we get this structure which is laid out we get these events which are laid out in a certain order. And then the final event in that structure is significant. And then in the latter half of Judges 13, we get the same structure, the same events happen just five or six verses later. You get the exact same um, components to the narrative happening, but the final component is different. And if we pay attention to the final component, which is what that structure is drawing our attention to, then we learn something interesting. Okay, so we've seen this number with Samson. What does Samson tell us about the Messiah? Well, at the beginning of Judges 13, we see the description of a man and his wife. In Judges 13, 6, five verses later, four verses later, we see a description of a man and his wife who are Samson's mother and father, Manoah and his wife. Judges 13, 3, we see the appearance of an angel. That's what we see after the description of the man and his wife later in Judges 13. Then we see the promise of a son being given. We see the promise of a son being given. I mean, this should be also familiar to us from um, the angel appearing to Miriam and giving the promise of the son. We see the promise of the son, and we see the stipulations of the Nazarite vow given. Later, we see the stipulations of the Nazarite vow given. Okay, and this is all pointing us towards something. The next element at the beginning is that he will save Israel. The next element is his death. Okay, so we've got this link between his death and him saving Israel, which is, of course, true of Yeshua and we can see Samson as this messianic figure 
and we get this, it's like the text itself is constructed in such a way to teach us this. The Messiah was hidden in the scriptures from the beginning. This is, in my mind, the sort of thing that Yeshua could have been explaining to them on the road to Emmaus. Okay, in the kind of the Jewish way of studying things, you get something which is known as Atbash. Okay, Atbash is so called because you've got the Aleph, that's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, then you've got the Tav, that's the final letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And these structures, you take the first element and you take the last element, okay? And they will be the same or they'll be a mirror image of each other. They'll be related to each other. They'll contain the same elements. Then you go to the second element, the bait, like the B, okay? And then the sheen, the bait is the second letter. The sheen is the second to last. So you take the second element, the second to last. First, last, second element, second to last. And you continue like this until you get to the part of the text that it's honing in on, that it's closing in on. So the Jews would refer to this as an at-bash structure. In English, we might call it an asby structure, okay? A and Z, A and Z, the first and the last, B and Y, the second, and the second to last. So you understand how the structure is going to be. So you will get the first element, the last element, second element, second to last, etc. to the middle. And in the middle, you'll find the thing that the text is actually, in the things it says, pointing you to, the text is actually pointing you to a part of the text, which is important. Sometimes on the central axis, you will find that the elements start to reverse and everything after the central axis is what you saw before in reverse, sometimes not. But the central axis is always important and it will always teach you something important. So I'm going to have to read these. I thought they'd be bigger. I think people online can probably see them. Judges 13 and 25, the Ruach begins to move in Samuel between Sorah and Eshtaol. Okay, the last element in Judges 16 is Samson is buried between Sorah and Eshtaol. So you see Sorah and Eshtaol mentioned. There's an emphasis on and repetition of the words relating to Samson's eyes in Judges 14 at the beginning. In Judges 16, second to last element in this structure is Samson seeks vengeance for his eyes. So again, it's focused on Samson's eyes. Samson conquers the roaring lion in Judges 14. Judges 16, he conquers the Philistines. He conquers the 3,000 Philistines. Samson had a feast in Judges 14. The Philistines have a feast in Judges 16. Samson makes fun of the Philistines who triumph in the end. The Philistines make fun of Samson who triumphs in the end. So it's the same thing, but it's a reversal here. Samson took what didn't belong to him and returned to Israel in one particular circumstance. And again, Samson, Samson takes what didn't belong to him and he returns to Israel at the end of the narrative. Samson desires to go into his wife in Judges 15 at the beginning. Samson desires to go into a prostitute in Judges 16. Samson's unfulfilled desire at the beginning to go into his wife. You also see an unfulfilled, or sorry, a rather a desire that is fulfilled at the end. Here though, it's the reverse. It's a desire that's fulfilled and this desire is a thirst that he has. So you see his desire fulfilled here. Judges 15, you see the usage of animals, which are foxes, you know, where he ties the tails together of the foxes and they go in and they set fire to all of the crops. We see the usage of animals at the end as well, the jawbone of the donkey, which is used. 
We also see an image of fire and we also see burning vegetation. So within this narrative, which teaches us something on the surface, the plain meaning of the text, within that we've got this structure which is honing in on a central part. The Philistines investigated the course the cause of the problems, and they confronted the cause. Judah investigate the cause of the problem and confront the cause at the end of the narrative. Samson is attacked in Judges 15, and the Philistines are attacked. You notice this is closing in. This is Judges 15, 8, where Samson's attacked. The Philistines are attacked in Judges 15, 9, but there's an element that's between those two attacks, which is the thing that the text is focusing our attention in on. And that thing is Samson dwelling in the rock. Okay, obvious messianic significance there. So Samson's a messianic figure. Moses is a messianic figure. Joseph is a messianic figure. Aaron's a messianic figure. Daniel's a messianic figure. And Jonah's a messianic figure. Jonah's the one that, of course, Yeshua points to specifically. But Joshua is also a messianic figure. And we see the number three, 33,000 with Joshua throughout the narrative. So look out for those as we're going through the book of Joshua, because Joshua is somebody who is one of those, you know, the really big pictures of Yeshua, like uh, Joseph, or uh, much more than Aaron, I would say, or Jonah. Okay, Joshua is going to teach us a lot about Yeshua, and you'll notice in all of these things, it teaches us about the gospel, the thing that is particularly pointed out by all of these uh, the structures, by all of the um, pictorial representations of the people. What we're learning about is the gospel the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. So in Joshua 1.1, 1, 1, it says, It came to be after the death of Moshe, the servant of Yehovah, that Yehovah spoke to Yahushua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moshe, saying, Moshe, my servant, is dead. So now arise, pass over this Yardane, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the children of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given you, as I spoke to Moshe, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, is your border. No man is going to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moshe, so I am with you. I do not fail you, nor forsake you. Be strong, that word is chazak, and courageous, and that word is a mat. We've looked at the word chazak before. This is what Yahuwah did to Pharaoh's heart. He strengthened it. He chazaked Pharaoh's heart. Okay, we've got this word a mat translated as courageous. We've seen Hebrew words before where we've said the English words which are used to approximate it are just approximations. They don't entirely encapsulate that word. And so you have to use different English words wherever you see this word amats or in some of the places to encapsulate the entirety of what it's trying to get across. For you are to let this people inherit the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be chazak and very amats to God to do according to all the Torah which Moshe my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it right or left so that you act wisely wherever you go. Do not let this book of the Torah depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you guard to do according to all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous and act wisely. Have I not commanded you, be chazak and amats. Do not be afraid, nor be discouraged. For Yehovah your Elohim is with you wherever you go. Kind of the flip side of being chazak and amats. So the word amats here, you see, says to be strong, to be alert, courageous, brave, stout, 
bold, solid, to be hard, to harden something, okay? Really what this word speaks of to me is being bold and being ready and being willing, which is obviously all good terminology when we're thinking of doing the Torah, what we have to be in order to do the Torah, because we will be tested in things, okay? We're not to be in fear when something comes along and we think, how am I even going to do that? I know that if I do that, the normal course of events will be that something bad would happen. Yalva says, be chazak, be a mats. Don't be discouraged. Don't be fearful. Do these things. Don't go to the right and don't go to the left. This is what uh, Gazinius says about this word, a mats. Okay, we are concerned with this passage here. Um, the verbs all take on different forms. The form of the verb we're dealing with is the cal form. Okay, you see here, you can have the cal form, the pl form, the hithpa'el form, and the hithil form, and they all mean slightly different things. Well, we're dealing with the cal form when it's said to Joshua. You might also hear of this as the pa'al form. Okay, so if you ever read pa'al, just think cal, they're the same. So Gazinius says to be alert, to be firm, to be strong, kindred to this word, to be eager, okay, properly of alertness of the feet. Okay, so it's talking about this readiness, this willingness. It can be courage to be courageous to do something, to be ready and to be alert to take this thing on, to be bold and stout in it. Think of David. Okay, David is a man that when he came against Goliath, you could describe his actions and how he was in just going and picking up the stones to kill Goliath and his brother. That is, they are the actions of a man who is a mat. Genesis 25, 23 uses this word in, uh, in an interesting way when we consider Joshua as being told, do the Torah, be strong and be a mat in following the Torah. Yehovah said to Rivka, two nations are in your womb. Okay, Jacob and Esau. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be more a mat than the other people. Which is interesting when we think Jacob, the ones who become Israel, they're the ones who wrestle with God. They're the ones who, when they're challenged to do something, which perhaps they're fearful over, they're the ones who do it anyway. And then you've got Esau, who's the sort of person who sells his birthright just for a single bowl of pottage, for something that's material. He will give up the inheritance for that. And he doesn't find the place for repentance. Even though he seeks that place of repentance with tears, he's never brought to a place where he is repented. So one people shall be more a mats than the other. That's Jacob. Deuteronomy 15 verse 7 says, When there is a poor man with you, one of your brothers within any of the gates in your land which Yehovah your Elohim has given you, do not make your heart a mat. Okay, it says harden your heart here. We saw the other word, chazak, used to Pharaoh when he, his heart was hardened by Yehovah, but his heart was strengthened. Here, it's do not make your heart a mat against your brother. Psalm 27 verse 14, David is told, wait on Yehovah, be chazak, and let him strengthen your heart. We know that our inner man is strengthened by his spirit. But the way that it's described here in Psalm 27 is that our heart is made a mat. It's made bold. It's made ready and willing to act by Yehovah's spirit. That's what he does. It's not so much making it strong, although he does also strengthen us, but he makes our heart to be in this state. And this state is necessary if we are going to follow Torah because we will be challenged 
by things in the word. We, we are told by the word we have to be proven. Our faith has to be proven. And in order to prove our faith, we have to have something that we find difficult, that we find challenging, that we are fearful of. We wait on Yehovah. We are Chazak, and we allow him to make our heart a mat. So Joshua is told, be Chazak and be very a mat to God to do according to all the Torah which Moshe, my servant, commanded you. Because you need to be a mat to do it. Do not turn from it right or left so that you act wisely wherever you go. Do not let this book, the Torah, depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you got to do according to all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous and act wisely. Have I not commanded you, be chazak and amatz. Do not be afraid, nor be discouraged. That's eratz and chatat. For Yehovah your Elohim is with you wherever you go. So when we're challenged by these things, we're to be strong, we're to be a mat, we're to be bold and ready and willing to do these things. We're not to be a rat and we're not to be chetat. A rat, okay, to tremble, to dread, to fear. Okay, so it's dreading something. Sometimes when you read something in the word, you think, I've no idea how I'm going to do that thing. Okay, and it can inspire in you fear of that thing because you don't know how you're going to do it and if it was just you and you were required to do that then maybe it would end in something bad but our belief is in Yehovah it's our belief in Yehovah that allows us to be chazak and it allows our hearts to be a mat because when he's asked us to do something we don't know how it's going to work out but we know that he is with us in it and that enables us to be strong and to be courageous. So we're not to dread and we're not to fear. We're not to tremble before these things. Okay? It's okay to have that instant reaction of, oh no, how am I going to do that? But then that is quelled by Yehovah making your heart a mat and knowing that he is with you in those things. Deuteronomy 7, 17 to 21 says, when you say in your heart, these nations are greater than I. I am unable to drive them out. Do not be afraid of them. That's the word Yare. Remember well what Yehovah your Elohim did to Pharaoh and to all Mitraim. And this word Yare is used along with this word Aratz, to fear, to tremble. They're synonymous to a large degree. The great trials which your eyes saw, the signs and the wonders, the strong hand, the outstretched arm by which Yahuwah your Elohim brought you out, Yahuwah your Elohim does so to all the peoples of whom you are afraid. So you're going to be afraid when you see what it is that you've got to conquer. But when these things come up in your heart, don't be afraid. Let your heart be a mat. Be strengthened by Yehovah. Yehovah, your Elohim, also sends the horn among them until those who are left, who hide themselves from you, are destroyed. Do not be afraid of them. That's that word, erats. For Yehovah, your Elohim, the great and awesome ale is in your midst. So when you're scared, don't be scared. You're going to be scared at first, but allow your heart to be strengthened and to be a mat because of Yehovah. This teaches us something about the gospel. As I say, Joshua will teach us things about the, the gospel. Joshua is told, be strong and be courageous. Do not fear. Okay, and we, in our belief of the gospel and our belief being obedience, the same is true for us. That is a necessary component. What was necessary for Joshua is necessary for us. Okay, the other word was chetat, okay, meaning to be shattered, to be dismayed, to be broken. So when you see the enemy, don't be dismayed of them. When you see what is required of you, if it is something that you're fearful of, don't be destroyed by it. Don't be dismayed about it. Okay, you will be fearful of that thing, but that's necessary for your faith 
to be tested. This is all a part of the gospel. When the gospel was given to the Israelites, for, for example, the thing that was missing for them was belief. Okay, this is what Gazenius says about this. He says it is properly to break, okay, to be broken. So this idea of being dismayed or being broken by something. When you see the enemy, don't be dismayed. Don't be broken in yourself because of them. Be chazak and be amatz. Matthew 13, 20 to 22 illustrates for us how people are broken and how they're fearful when things in the word come up, when these tests of our faith come up. Okay, the parable of the sower. That which is sown on rocky places, this is he who hears the word and immediately they receive it with joy because the good news is great. You've got the salvation of your soul. Okay, brilliant. I'm on board with this. So immediately they receive the word with joy. But he has no root in himself and is short-lived. And when pressure or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. So something comes up, some kind of pressure or persecution because you're starting to follow the word. Don't be afraid in that instance. The people who are sown on rocky, rocky places in the parable, immediately they stumble when these things come against them because they are broken and they're dismayed by them. That which is sown upon the thorns is he who hears the word and the worries of this age. Okay, so again, worry, fear, being broken, being dismayed by these things, the deceit of riches choke the word and it becomes fruitless. So what we're told is we're to be chazak and to be amatz when these pressures come upon us. Hebrews 4, 1 to 2 tells us that this is a part of receiving the gospel. It says, therefore, since a promise remains of entering into his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the good news, the gospel was brought to us as well as to them, as well as to the people in the past. But the word that they heard did not profit them, not having been mixed with belief. So what we're seeing in Joshua, the part of the gospel that we're seeing is that we need to have faith. We need to be strong. We need to be strengthened by Yehovah. We need to be courageous. We need to not fear when these things come, when these pressures come, or when worries come upon us from following the word. We'll be strong and we're courageous. Hebrews 4 verse 15 shows us that Yeshua was the same. Okay, Yeshua was Elohim. The word of Elohim made flesh. He came to the earth. It says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was tried in all respects as we are apart from sin. So Yeshua was flesh, okay? He was tried as we are, okay? Exactly the same sort of things that we worried about, he worried about, okay? But he was without sin, as we've learned from the beginning, sin's desire is towards you, but you should master it. Yeshua was tried in exactly the same way as we are, but he didn't sin. He's the example to us. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Yeshua came with them to a place called Gethsemane, said to the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Kepher and the two sons of Zavdai, and he began to be grieved and deeply distressed. Okay, well, what does Yehovah say? He says, when these things arise in your heart, do not fear. Okay. Yeshua was tried in the same way. He was distressed, but he was chazak, and he was amatz in the face of all of these things, like Joshua. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly grieved even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And going forward a little, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not my will be done, but yours. And Joshua was exactly the same. Okay, we have these as examples to us. 
when that fear or that dismay arises in our hearts and we think, how am I to do this? We remember the Yehovah is with us and we're strengthened by it and our heart is made a mat. Luke 21, 9 to 12. Okay. Obviously, the New Testament's written in Greek. It says, when you hear of wars and unrests, do not be alarmed. And that's that same word in the Septuagint as we saw as being dis- dismayed. Chatat. Okay, so Yeshua says, when you hear of wars and unrests, and he gives the same admonition, don't be dismayed. Don't be broken by these things. As it's translated here, do not be alarmed. For these things have to take place, but the end is not soon. Okay, so when we see these things taking place, they have to take place. But Yeshua tells us the end isn't soon. That's not what you're looking for, for the end. Then he said to them, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be great earthquakes in various places, scarcities of food, deadly diseases, and there shall be horrors and great signs from heaven. Okay? So, arguably, we are seeing some of these sorts of things. We're seeing deadly diseases. Okay? Not so much we're seeing great signs from heaven. And then Yeshua gives us the one thing that we're looking for, the one thing by which we're going to be able to identify No, okay, this isn't the stuff that's happening when the end is not near. This is the end. He says, but before all this, so before even you see these wars and nations rising against nations, earthquakes, deadly diseases, signs from heaven, before you even see those things, you must have seen something else first. He says, before all this, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you delivering you up to the congregations and prisons and be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. So when we're looking for signs of the end and we're looking at all of these things, how we know whether or not they're the actual signs of the end, the actual birth pangs, is before all this, they'll lay their hands on you and they'll take you before the rulers. Okay, that's something that could happen very quickly, okay, you think of the rise of um, certain political correctness in the world and certain things having violence done against them. So that could rise very quickly. But before we start looking to signs like this, to say, well, these are the signs of the end, first of all, this is going to happen, will be delivered up to rulers. But the admonition from Yeshua is exactly the same. Do not be alarmed. Be strong. Be courageous. Be chazak. And be a mats. In the last part, we saw that Joshua is one of these people in whom we can see a picture of Messiah. And when we see these people, we learn something through them about the gospel. We learn something through them about the good news. So what we should expect to see in Joshua's life is we should expect to see some kind of mention of this number three. And I'm not saying that every time in the Bible you see the number three, it's to do with the Messiah. I don't know. I've not checked them all out. But commonly when you see this, it is. So we're up to uh, verse 10, chapter 1. Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare food for yourselves, for within three days you are passing over this Yardane to go in to possess the land which Jehovah your Elohim is giving you to possess. Okay, now this is, this is interesting. We think, okay, they're told to pre- prepare food for these three days. Seems like a fairly reasonable thing to be told. But in Joshua 5, it says, The children of Israel, camped in Gilgal, performed the Passover on the 14th day of the Chodesh at evening on the desert plains of Jericho. And they ate of the stored grain of the land 
on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened bread and roasted grain on the same day. And the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the stored grain of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. So, before this, what they were eating was manna. So, in what we're reading, what they were eating was manna. And they're told, take this manna and prepare enough of it for three days. So we know when it came to the Shabbat, for example, they were told to bake and cook what they wanted to and leave the rest over until the morning. Here, we also see that they're told to prepare food for three days this time in advance. So the manna could be taken and prepared in advance. Verse 12 says, And Yahushua spoke to the Ravenites and to the Gadites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, saying, Remember the word which Moshe, servant of Yahuwah, commanded you, saying, Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you rest, and he shall give you this land. And this word here is Nuach. Nuach is the word for rest that you sometimes see associated with the Sabbath rest. So we've got this preparation of food for three days, and then we've got this mention of the same sort of rest that you get on the Sabbath. I don't know if they're connected, but it stuck out to me. So Elohim's giving you rest, and he shall give you this land. Let your wives, your little ones, and your livestock stay in the land which Moshe gave you beyond the ordain, but you shall pass before your brothers in fives, all your brave fighters, and shall help them. So when they came to this area, they saw that it was good for raising flocks on. And they said to Moshe, can we have this land as our inheritance? Moshe asked Yehovah, they're allowed to keep that land, but they have to go and fight in the land of Canaan. So their land is on the other side of the Jordan. But when all of Israel cross over the Jordan, they were told, you're going to have to go over and you're going to have to fight. Your little ones and your wives can stay on the other side where you guys, you've got to come over. You can't just dwell there and not help the rest of Israel. Until Yehovah has given your brothers rest as unto you, so shall they also take possession of the land which Yehovah your Elohim is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and shall possess that which Moshe the servant of Yehovah gave you beyond the, Yord the Ordain toward the rising of the sun. So this is the, the fulfillment, if you like, of what we saw in Torah portions, Matot and Masay. They answered Joshua saying, all that you have commanded us, we do. And wherever you send us, we go. According to all that we obeyed Moshe, so we obey you. Only let Yehovah your Elohim be with you as he was with Moshe. Whoever rebels against your command and does not obey your words in all that you command him is put to death. Only be chazak and be a matz. So they're saying, let Yehovah be with you as he was with Moshe. We want you to be chazak and we want you to be a matz. And interestingly, they say, whoever rebels against your command shall be put to death, which is something that we read in the Torah in Deuteronomy 17. You see, Deuteronomy was what was read to these people by Moshe. So they possibly, they've recognized this is the way that the Torah says that it should be done. And they've said, okay, this is the way that it shall be. We will obey the Torah. So one of these at bash we see in this account that we've seen so far, we've, we've been through the first, say, 12 verses of the book of Joshua. So one of these chiastic structures that's going to point us to something important is at the beginning, Yehovah commanded the people to prepare to take the land. Joshua gave the command to prepare to possess the land at the end. Yisrael will receive the land spoken of by Moshe. That's what's mentioned in Joshua 1 verse 3. Joshua 1.13 Remember what Moshe told you, Yehovah will give you the land. Same elements we're seeing here. Yehovah gave the boundaries of the land with respect to water barriers, which were the Mediterranean and the Euphrates rivers. 
and he uses the phrase towards the setting of the sun. So he says, this is going to be the land, these are going to be the barriers and the water barriers. At the end, Joshua gave the barriers of the inheritances of Gad, Reuben, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. So those two and a half tribes that were on the other side of the Yardane, he gives the boundaries of their inheritance with respect to the Jordan River two times. Again, he uses the phrase, towards the rising of the sun. Yehovah promised to be faithful to Joshua. Yehovah will be with Joshua as he was with Moshe. No man shall be able to stand up to him. The end, Yisrael promises to be faithful to Joshua. They will heed Joshua as long as Yehovah is with him as he was with Moshe, and they will even kill anyone who rebels against him. See, Yehovah says, no man will stand against you, and Israel effectively say the same thing to him. As I was with Moshe, I'll be with you. I am with you wherever you go, we see later on. I will not forsake you. Do not fear, nor lose resolve. Be strong and courageous. Behold, I have commanded you, be strong and courageous. I will cause the people to inherit the land. You will make your way successful and act wisely in the land. Observe the Torah, observe the Torah. You shall not deviate from it. The Torah shall not depart from your mouth. It's effectively the same thing. Then the central point that it's pointing to, the part of the text that our attention is being drawn to with these things, is you will succeed wherever you go. Yahushua, son of Nun, secretly sent out two men from Shittim to spy, saying, go see the land in Yericho. And they went and came to the house of a woman, a prostitute, and her name was Rechav, and they lay down there. But it was reported to the king of Yericho, saying, See, men from the children of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Yericho sent to Rechav, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. These elements of this narrative we're going to see in other narratives elsewhere in Scripture. So it's all going to help us put together this picture of the gospel and what it is that the, the Tanakh teaches us about the gospel. The woman had taken the two men and she hid them. So she said, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it came to be as the gate was being shut when it was dark, that the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly so that you overtake them. But she brought them up to the, up to the roof and had hidden them with the stalks of flax, which she laid out on the roof. And the men pursued them by the way to the Yardane, to the fords, and they shut the gate afterwards as soon as the pursuers had come out. So they come to her, and the pursuers come, and they say, well, where are the men? She's hidden the men, but she says, I don't know where they've, where they've gone. Quick, you better go out and, and pursue them while you can find them. Before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and she said to the men, I know that Yehovah has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of you. Okay, so she has seen what Yehovah has done. She's not a part of Israel, but she's seen what Yehovah has done and his power. For we have heard how Yehovah dried up the water of the Sea of Reeds for you when you came out of Mitraim, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Yardane, Sichon and Og, whom you put under the ban. Part of what the gospel is, part of what the good news is, part of what salvation is, remembering the word salvation and the word deliverance are the same word in Hebrew and in Greek, Part of it is this defeat of the enemy, okay? And part of what she recognizes is within Yehovah's power, what she specifically says, this is defeat of the enemy. We saw what you did to the enemy, what Yehovah did. And when we heard 
our heart melted and there was no spirit left in anyone because of you. For Yehovah, your Elohim, he is Elohim in heavens above and on earth beneath. And now please swear to me by Yehovah, since I have shown you kindness, that you also show kindness to my father's house and shall give me a true token and shall spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and all that they have and shall deliver or save, same word, our souls from death. So this Gentile woman, having seen the salvation or the deliverance that Yehovah has brought to Israel, she asks that salvation is brought, that their souls are saved. And the men said to her, our souls for yours. If you do not expose this matter of ours, then it shall be when Yehovah has given us the land that we, treat, we shall treat you in kindness and truth. Of course, this being a picture of Yeshua who gave his soul for ours. His soul went to Sheol for three days before he was risen back to life. When we go into the land, we'll treat you in kindness and truth. And she let them down by a rope through the window for her house was on the city wall and she dwelt on the wall. She said to them, go, up, go to the mountain lest the pursuers come upon you and you shall hide there three days until the pursuers have returned and afterwards you'll go on your way. So three days, you're in a situation where you're being pursued to be killed. After three days, you'll come back. The men said to her, we are released from this oath of yours, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father and your mother and your brothers and your father's household to your own home. And it shall be that anyone who goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood is on his own head and we are innocent. And anyone who is with you in the house his blood is on our head if a hand is laid upon him. If you expose this matter of ours, then we shall be released from your oath, which you made us swear. So, what can we see from the structures of this that teach us about the gospel? There's a number of things in there that possibly stuck out to you from other narratives. Let's see what's, what's there. First element Rahab says, go to the mountains lest the pursuers see you. Hide three days until the pursuers turn back. Last element, after arriving at the mountain, the spies hid three days until the pursuers turn back. The pursuers couldn't find them because they were hiding. So the exact same elements are mentioned again at the end. The spies said, you shall tie this cord of scarlet thread in your window. The spies also said, we are absolved of this oath unless... The end, the spy said, if you relate this discussion, we will be absolved of our oath. And then we've got the tying of the scarlet cord in the window. The spy said, bring your father and his entire house, your mother and brothers into the house. The end, or more towards the end, this is actually one verse apart. Anyone who stays with you uh, in the house. So her mother's uh, her brothers and her father and all the rest are mentioned. The central element of this is anyone who leaves the doors of your house for the outside, his blood will be on his own head and we will be absolved. Okay, so what does this relate to us regarding the gospel? Exodus twelve twenty two to 23, you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood. Okay, so you've got the scarlet that is in the basin, and you strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin, and you, none of you, shall go out of the door of his house until morning. And Yehovah shall pass on to smite the Mitrites, and shall see the blood, the scarlet, on the lintel and on the two doorposts, and Yehovah shall pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. So we've got the blood of the Passover lamb. You sure is our Passover lamb. They put it as a sign on the house and they say, anyone who's in the house, they're going to be okay, but you can't leave the house. Exactly as is given to Rahab, who's also got to give this sign with 
the scarlet cord in her window so that those in her house, their souls will be saved or delivered. Joshua 2, 3 to 7, we see this. The king sent people to Rechav looking for the spies. In verse 7, the men of Yericho pursued the spies. Joshua 2, 4, Rechav hid the spies. Joshua 2, 6, Rechav hid the spies on a roof in the stalks of the flesh. It's mentioned again, the same elements. Rechav stated, I don't know where they are from. Later, I don't know where they went. And the central element, the spies left Yericho through the city gate when it was about to close at dark. It seems like a bit of a strange element for all of the chiasm to be pointing to. You know, you could say, well, Yeshua is the gate and he saves us from darkness and we move into light and all that sort of stuff. That would be perfectly valid, but there's more to this. What we see throughout all of these scriptures, throughout all of what Yeshua would call Torah, the prophets, the writings, the Torah of Moshe, we see these accounts which teach us about the gospel. And often these accounts are linked one to another by a particular thing. So here we've got a mention of the gates and darkness. We remember that Samson is this messianic figure. We compare the two spies, Samson and the gates. We'll see these things being linked together. Joshua 2.1, Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two spies to spy secretly, saying, go view the land. In Judges 16.1, we've got Shimshon going to Azar, or Gaza. Joshua 2.1, they came to a prostitute's house named Rechav. Judges 16, Shimshon saw a prostitute and he went in unto her. And lodged there is mentioned in the two spies. Shimshon lay till midnight and arose at midnight. So he lodged there too. Joshua 2.2, they're told the king of Yericho saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. In Judges 16, it was told to the uh, Azathites, saying, Shimshon is come thither. Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they, show, for they be come to search out all the country, is what is said in Joshua. In Judges, they compassed him in, and they laid wait for him. The woman took the two men and she hid them. Shimshon was hidden inside the harlot's house. It came to pass about the time of shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Samson, he arose at midnight when it was dark, and he took the doors of the gate of the city. And the final element we've got, it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. This is what we have at the, um, at the end of the narrative about Yericho. So with Samson, he took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts, and he went away with them, bar and all, obviously, so that they could gain entrance to the city. If we look at this again from another aspect, we've got the spies went to observe to see, or to re'eh Yericho. In Judges, Samson went to Azar, and he saw a harlot, same word that is used there. The spies stayed at the house of a harlot. Samson stayed with the harlot. The spies lodged at Rahab's house. Samson slept with the harlot, and he arose from his sleep at midnight. The king of Yericho was told that the Israelites had come into Yericho. The Azathites were told that Shimshon had come into Azar. The pursuers tried to capture the two Israelite spies. The Azathites lay in wait for Shimshon to catch him. The spies remained hidden from their pursuers. Although the Azathites laid in wait at the city gate, Shimshon was hidden from them, for we read of no resistance from the Azathites at the city gates. Okay, they're there waiting for him, but when he comes in, they don't do anything. 
Rahab told the king that the spies had left through the city gate when it was dark and the city gate was about to close. And Shimshon left through the city gate at midnight. The point that it's leading us to, the Israelites breached the wall around Jericho and the entire wall fell down. So that's what happens when the trumpet sounds, as we saw in the other one, the walls fell down. So here, the result of that is the Israelites breached the wall. And here, Samson, one of Yehovah's people, breached the wall around Azar by taking its city gates. So we see this relation to the two things. This ultimate thing that it's pointing us to here is the same thing that the chiastic structure was pointing us to. So these things are important things. They're linking these two narratives as important. So what can we learn about the gospel, about salvation or deliverance in the stories of the spies and Samson? Rahab stated, we've heard how Yehovah dried up the waters of the Red Sea. Sihon and Og, Israel's enemies, were utterly destroyed. Samson killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. Samson became very thirsty. Okay, we've got this mention of the waters being dried up. Now we've got the vanquishing of the enemy. Samson became very thirsty and said, You have granted this great salvation through the hand of your servant, and now shall I die of thirst. So this salvation was brought by Moshe with his outstretched arm, drying up of the water. Here we've got the enemy being vanquished and the mention of thirst. This was done by splitting the Red Sea in uh, Joshua. That's what's mentioned in Joshua. Judges, this was done by, the, by splitting the hollow of the jawbone. Same word that's used there. Rahav stated, no spirit remained in any man because of you. In Judges, again, we've got the mention of the Ruach. His Ruach returned to him and he was revived. All of these elements are to do with salvation. They're to do with the gospel. Rahav requested that the spies take an oath to spare her life. Here, Samson had the tribe of Judah swear that they wouldn't kill him. So we've got two oaths that they wouldn't be killed. Rahav lowered the spies by a rope and told them to go to a mountain to hide. In Judges, they bind Samson with ropes, same word used, and they brought him up and said they're lowering him down from a rock. The final element is that the spies are told to hide for three days before going on their way. Picture of Yeshua. And then with Samson, Samson defeats the enemy. All of this is teaching us about the good news. It's teaching us about deliverance in salvation as it pertains to us. This defeating of the enemy tied to the three days laying low before you go on your way. Okay, you show a conquering death by... Um, as when he was resurrected after three days. First Corinthians fifteen twenty six tells us that the last enemy to be brought to naught, the last thing that we get deliverance or salvation from, the last enemy is death. See, we have a real inaccurate view of what salvation is. Salvation is all about being delivered from one's enemies. Okay, something which is stronger than you, that you are powerless to defeat, being defeated by Yehovah. And that's what we're seeing in all of these narratives. It is especially true of death. Death is an enemy that we are unable to conquer on our own. And we need the salvation or the deliverance of Yehovah to overcome. Okay, so if we look at a chiastic structure in Joshua 2... We'll see what else we can learn. Rahab hid the spies on the roof in stalks of flasks. The pursuers chased them towards the Jordan crossing, and the pursuers went in the wrong direction. Rahab lowered the spies by a rope. She lived high on the city wall. She told the spies to hide for three days until the pursuers turned back, then continue, and the pursuers went in the wrong direction. Different verses, but it's the same thing which is mentioned in each of them. Rahab said, I know Yehovah has given you the land 
swear to me by Yahuwah. The spy said, when Yahuwah gives us the land, our souls for yours. And the middle point in that is Rahab saying, give me a sign or a token that you will keep me alive, or you keep alive my father, mother, brothers, sisters, and all that's theirs. How? By saving our souls from death. The salvation of the soul, the deliverance of the soul from the ultimate enemy being death. So all of this is right there all the way through the scriptures. It teaches us of who Yeshua is and what Yeshua was going to do. Now, if we compare the two spies in Joshua 2 with another set of two spies that we'll see, we'll establish a connection between the two narratives. Two Yisraelites are spies for Yahushua, for Joshua. Yehonathan and Achimaat are two spies for David. Two spies were given military intelligence and they were told to deliver it to Joshua. Yehonathan and Achimaat were given military intelligence and they're told to deliver it to David, the ones that they're spies for. Two spies come to Rahab's house in Yericho. We've got Yehonathan and Achimaat came to a house in uh, Bahurim. Rahab gave the spies military intelligence. Here we have a girl giving Yehonathan and Achimaat military intelligence. It was told to the king of Yericho that the two spies had come in. A young man saw Yehonathan and Achimaat come in and told Av Avshalom. Rechav helped the two spies hide on the roof, and a woman helped Yehonathan and Achimaat hide in a well. It's the same narrative. It's that thing where the word of Elohim is the same throughout time. All that we have is different characters playing out the same things over and over again. Rahav covered the two spies with stalks of flax. A woman covered the well containing Yehonathan and Achimaat with groats. The king of Yericho's servants inquired about the two spies, and then Avshalom's servants inquired about Yehonathan and Achimaat. Rahav told the king of Yericho's servants that the two spies had fled. A woman told Avshalom's servants that Yehonathan and Achimaat had fled. The king of Yericho's servants searched for the two spies, but couldn't find them. Avshalom's servants searched for Yehonathan and Achimaat, but couldn't find them. The two spies emerged from hiding after the king of Yericho's servants had left. They emerged after they'd left, and Yehonathan and Achimaat emerged after Avshalom's servants had left. The two spies crossed over the Yardane. The woman said that Yehonathan and Achimaat had crossed over the Yardane. This is why when we have issues in our lives that we can look to the word of Elohim and we can find what the solution is from that. We can find times when people have encountered similar things and done something the wrong way and how that didn't work out or what is the correct way to do it. This is why the word is living and why it's cyclical. The two spies delivered the military intelligence to Yahushua. Yehonathan and Achimaat delivered the military intelligence to David, ultimately. So there's this linkage between those two spies and the two spies in David. We know that the two spies teach us about the gospel in Joshua. We see the same thing in the narrative in 2 Samuel. So the beginning of this chiastic structure, Yehonathan and Achimaat descend into a well. Again, it's descending into the pit. A woman spread the curtain over the well. The end, Yoav's men throw Avshalom's body into a large pit and erect a mound of stones over the top. So these same things. Achithophel's suicide by hanging. We see Avshalom dead at the end, hanging in the tree. Avshalom appointed Amasa over his army in place of Yoav. David's position at Mahanaim is mentioned. 
We've got David appointing officers um, at the end. David's position is mentioned again near the city gate. And all of this is pointing us to the middle, which is something which is going to tell us something about salvation, about deliverance, about the good news. Three men brought David and his servants provisions because they were hungry, exhausted, and thirsty in the desert. Okay? As opposed to, I suppose, adding drunkenness to thirst. For us, in the picture of salvation, hunger, exhaustion that we have, and our thirst is met. And again, we have the number three mentioned. And Joshua 2 continues and says, And she said, Let it be according to your words. And she sent them away, and they went, and she bound the scarlet cord in the window. So they left and came to the mountain and stayed there three days until the pursuers returned. And the pursuers sought them in all the way, but they did not find them. So they were trying to kill them. They hid there for three days, and then they came out to life. The two men returned. They came down from the mountain. They passed over, and they came to Yehoshua, son of Nun, and they related to him all that had befallen them. And they said to Yehoshua, Truly Yehovah has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land have melted away because of us. Again, another aspect of salvation. This will happen at the end, the salvation which is yet to come, when Yeshua comes and defeats the enemy before us to lead us into the land. When it will be said, truly Yehovah has given the, all of the land into our hands. Or something else to remember about Rahav. Okay? Something else to do with salvation, deliverance, and the good news. Rahav is a Gentile. Rahav isn't a part of Israel. In Isaiah 56, 3 to 5, it says, And let not the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to Yehovah speak, saying, Yehovah has certainly separated me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Look, I am a dry tree. For thus said Yehovah to the eunuchs who guard my Sabbaths and have chosen what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, those foreigners who do this. To them I shall give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I give them an everlasting name that is not cut off. So something we can learn from Rechav is that Yehovah will accept these people into covenant, those people who take hold of the Sabbath, those people who take hold of the covenant. And this is an integral part of the gospel as explained um, in the New Testament writings. In Isaiah 42, one to seven, it says, see my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one, my soul has delighted in. I have put my spirit upon him. He brings forth justice to the nations. Okay, so this is a prophecy of Yeshua. And this is part of this deliverance, part of the salvation. The enemy will be wiped out, but those who want to join with Yehovah and hold fast to his covenant will be a part of his people. He does not cry out, nor lifts up his voice, nor causes his voice to be heard in the street. A crushed reed he does not break, and a smoking flax he does not quench. Okay, this is the position that the Gentiles are in. Okay, He doesn't see them as a crushed reed or a smoking flax and just snub them out or crush them because he can. He brings forth justice in accordance with truth. He does not become weak or crushed. He has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his Torah. Thus said the Eol, Yahuwah, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, and a spirit to those who walk on it. So the Gentiles. I, Yahuwah, have called you in righteousness, and I take hold of your hand and guard you and give you Yeshua, for a covenant to a people, for a light to the Gentiles. So it was written that this is part of Messiah's purpose. Okay, but this was not made clear until we have the New Testament writings, as we'll see. To open 
blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. So this is an integral part of what is prophesied in the Tanakh about Messiah. In Luke 2, 27 to 32, we've got Simeon or Shimon. He came in the spirit to the set apart place, the temple of Yehovah. And as the parents brought in the child Yeshua to do for him according to the usual practice of the Torah, then he took him up in his arms and blessed Elohim. He's been told that he will not die until he sees uh, the salvation of Elohim. Now let your servant go in peace. He's saying, I, I can die now. O oh, master, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your deliverance. They've seen your salvation. They've seen your Yeshua, perhaps in Hebrew, which you have prepared before the face of all the people. So he recognizes this in what he's saying. It's not just to Israel. It's the salvation to all of the people. A light for the unveiling of the Gentiles and the esteem of your people, Israel. That's what Yeshua is. Ephesians 3, 4 to 6 says, In reading this then, you are able to understand my insight into the secret of Messiah, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his set-apart apostles and prophets. The Gentiles to be co-heirs, united in the same body and partakers together uh, in the promise in Messiah through the good news. So this, as we've seen, is encoded in the Tanakh. All of these elements of salvation, these elements of Yeshua, the Messiah, were encoded in the Tanakh. But Paul says here, now you see my insight. This was not revealed to people before it was right there in the scriptures for them. Well, this is part of the secret of the Messiah, the promise through the good news. This is the gospel. Galatians 3, 28 to 29. There is not Jew nor Greek. There's not slave nor free. There's not male nor female. For you are all one in Messiah Yeshua. You are all Israel. There's no house of Judah and Gentiles and there's no separation there. You're all one now in Messiah Yeshua. And if you are of Messiah, then you are the seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. The promise of the land. That promise which was given to Abraham. The Gentiles, as Paul was writing, the secret of Messiah is that the Gentiles through him would be able to become co-heirs. And this is an element of the gospel. I bring all of this together at the end of the next Torah portion that I do. I want you to recognize all these individual elements of the gospel. Romans 11, 7 to 12 says, What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the chosen did obtain it, and the rest were hardened. So this is Israel, the physical descendants of Jacob, or the descendants of Israel. All of them did not obtain what they were seeking for. Okay? The ones who were the chosen, the Yehovah had chosen according to his foreknowledge, those who would submit to him and would follow him by faith, they obtained it, but the rest of them were hardened. As it has been written, Yehovah has given them a spirit of deep sleep, eyes not to see and ears not to hear unto this day. So this is Israel. David also says, let their table become for a snare and for a trap, and for a stumbling block, and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened not to see, and bow down their back always. I say then, if all of this is true about Israel, have they stumbled that they should fall? Is that what Yehovah's purpose in this is? Did he just want them to not get it, and to fall, and to stumble, and not make it into the kingdom? Let it not be, but by their fall, Deliverance or salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy, to provoke Israel to jealousy. That the, the Gentiles are all going to come to Yehovah and they're all going to be Yehovah's people. If their fall, if Israel's fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their completeness? 
So when the Gentiles come to Yehovah, if that's a good thing that Yehovah has used their fall for, how much more will he be able to use the submission and the faith of Israel? An example of this, the Gentiles coming to Yehovah and Israel being jealous, we see in Acts 13. Verse 42 says, And when the Jews went out of the congregation, the Gentiles begged to have these words spoken to them the next Sabbath. Okay, the Jews who had the word of Yehovah and made their boasts, oh, we've got the Torah, we were given the oracles of Yehovah, we've got the word of Yehovah, and yet they didn't follow it by faith. The Gentiles, when they heard the words of Yehovah, they begged to have them spoken to them. And when the meeting of the congregation had broken up, Many of the Jews and of the worshipping converts followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the favor or the grace of Elohim. And on the next Sabbath, almost all the city came together to hear the word of Elohim. These are Gentiles. All of them have come together. They heard the words and they begged that they would hear them again. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. And contradicting and speaking evil, they opposed what Shaul was saying. But speaking boldly, Shaul and Barnabas said, It was necessary that the word of Elohim should be spoken to you first, to the Jew first, but also to the Gentiles. But since you thrust it away and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, see, we turn to the Gentiles. So by Israel's fall, by the fact that they thrust the word of Elohim away from them salvation has come to the gentiles that it would make israel the, na the natural born tree that it would make them jealous for the master has commanded us i have set you to be a light to the gentiles that you should be deliverance to the ends of the earth or salvation to the ends of the earth so it's in the new testament that we begin to see all of these prophecies all these things that were encoded Within the Tanakh, we start to see the fulfillment of all of them. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and praised the word of Yehovah. And as many as had been appointed to everlasting life, believed. In Isaiah 62, uh, I think it's probably one to five actually. For Zion's sake, for Zion's sake, I am not silent. And for Yerushalayim's sake, I do not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her deliverance or her salvation as a lamp that burns until Yerushalayim's salvation or deliverance goes forth as a light to the Gentiles. Remember, Israel has fallen to bring the Gentiles in. And if that was used for good, how much more their completeness. The nation shall see your righteousness and all kings your esteem. Okay, Yehovah, if you give him more to work with, he can achieve even more. And in the millennium, Yerushalayim was going to go out as a light to the Gentiles. This is the end of Isaiah. We'll see that this is how Isaiah began as well. You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of Yehovah designates. You shall be a crown, a crown of comeliness in the hand of Yehovah and a royal headdress in the hand of your Elohim. You will be a beautiful thing. Lift up your eyes all around and see all of them have gathered. They have come to you. Your sons come from afar and your daughters are supported on the side. Then you shall see and be bright and your heart shall throb and swell. For the wealth of the sea is turned to you. The riches of the Gentiles shall come to you, to Jerusalem. A stream of camels cover your land. The drom dromedaries of Midian and Apha. All those from Shiva come bearing gold and incense and they're proclaiming the praises of Yehovah. Like the Gentiles who heard the word in the book of Acts here on a much greater scale. All the flocks of Kedar are gathered to you. The rams of Nevioth serve you. They come up for acceptance on my altar and I embellish my esteemed house. This is when they come to Jerusalem, which is how the book of Isaiah begins. 
Isaiah 2, 2 to 4. It shall be in the latter days. There are many periods of time that are referred to as the latter days in Scripture. That the mountain of the house of Yehovah is established on top of the mountains. And it shall be exalted above the hills. And all nations, all of the Gentiles shall flow to it. Many peoples shall come. And say, come and let us go up to the house of Yehovah, to the house, the Elohim of Jacob, and let him teach us his ways, just like in the book of Acts. And let us walk in his paths, for out of Sion comes forth the Torah and the word of Yehovah from Yerushalayim. And Yerushalayim is a light to the Gentiles. And he shall judge between the nations, and he will reprove many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither teach battle anymore. And indeed, Yeshua will judge between nations when he comes and he sits on the throne of his glory and he separates the sheep from the goats. He has all nations laid before him. Jeremiah 16 talks of the Gentiles turning to Yehovah. Yehovah, my strength, my stronghold, and my refuge in the day of distress. The Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited only falsehood and futility, and there is no value in them. Would the man make gods for himself, which are not gods, powerless gods? Therefore, see, I am causing them to know. This time I cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is Yehovah. This is a part of the gospel, that this salvation would be offered to the Gentiles too. As we've seen, all of it's there, it's encoded into the Tanakh, and all of the structures, it's right there in prophecy, and we see the fulfillment in Yeshua. Matthew twelve eighteen to 21. See my servant whom I have chosen. This is the passage that we read before being quoted. My beloved in whom my soul did delight. I shall put my spirit upon him and he shall declare justice to the nations. He shall not strive nor cry out nor shall anyone hear his voice in the streets. A crushed reed he shall not break and smoking flax he shall not quench till he brings forth judgment forever. And the nations shall trust in his name. And this is what we're seeing a picture of in this story with Joshua. Okay, Joshua being this picture of Messiah. See, this is exactly what Rahab is doing. And now, please swear to me by Yehovah. She's trusting in Yehovah's name. She's seeing the deliverance that he's brought. She's seeing the salvation brought by his mighty hand, by Moshe's outstretched arm in the Red Sea. Since I have shown you kindness, that you also show kindness to my father's house, and shall give me a true token, and shall spare my father and my mother, and my brothers and my sisters, and all that they have, and shall deliver our souls from death. The gospel right here in the book of Joshua. So we've seen that Joshua is this picture of Yeshua, and that his, his life teaches us things about the gospel, we can identify these things in his life. What we're going to see next is the parting of the Red Sea. We're gonna see what that, what things we can see from that about, really to do with the spreading of the good news and the, the way that these things spread um, among people, among the Gentiles and things like that. So verse 1 of chapter 3 says, And Yahushua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shittim and came to the Ardain. He and all the children of Israel and stayed there before they passed over. And it came to be, the three days, that the officers went into the midst of the camp. And they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of Yahuwah your Elohim, and the priests and the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Only keep a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, 
so that you know which way to go, for you have not passed over this way before. And Yahushua said to the people, set yourselves apart, for tomorrow Yahovah is doing wonders. And he tells them that he's going to be doing these wonders in their midst. So just like on Mount Sinai, when they had to set themselves apart, not sleep with their wives for three days, here they've got to be set apart because Yahuwah is actually going to be in their midst, physically in their midst, like being physically in the, uh, the tabernacle or the temple. So they have to be holy. Yahushua spoke to the priest saying, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. Okay, so this would be the, the Kohathites. They were the ones who were um, able to take the Ark. Okay, it says, in fact, specifically here, the priests. So this must be the sons of Aharon. Yahuwah said to Yahushua, This day I begin to make you great before the eyes of all Israel, so that they know that I am with you as I was with Moshe. So we're going to see this principle as we go through. This idea that Israel knew that Yehovah was with Moshe. He parted the Red Sea. And here, Yehovah says, they're going to know that I'm with you too when they see what I'm going to do, which is to part the Red Sea. And you command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, when you come to the edge of the water of the Yardane, stand in the Yardane. Yahushua said to the children of Israel, come near and hear the words of Yehovah, your Elohim. And Yahushua said, by this you shall know that the living Elohim, or Eol, is in your midst, and that he is certainly driving out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Gergeshites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Okay, so by this, you're going to know that he's in your midst. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Master of all the earth is passing over before you into the Ardain. So there's something about this where Joshua says, you're going to know that Yehovah is going to deliver you from your enemies. We've seen before how enemies in one's life for us is equivalent to, let's say, the things which we must overcome. Sin or whatever it is in our lives that we must overcome to obey Yehovah. So there's an element of Yehovah letting you know that he is with you. And by those things, you will know that he will be with you against the enemies as well. Now take for yourselves 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe. And it shall be as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of Yehovah, the master of all the earth, come to rest in the waters of the Ardain, that the waters of the Ardain are cut off, the waters that come down from up upstream and stand as a heap. So the ones who bear the word of Yehovah, okay, the ones who bear the ark of Yehovah. You can kind of think of this in the same sort of way as evangelizing. Evangelizing is to bring the good news to people. Here we see signs and wonders, okay, letting these people know that Yehovah is with them. And we see the same sort of things when the good news is being brought, that signs and wonders accompany it. And I think that most, if not all of us here can say that signs and wonders have accompanied the good news being brought to bear in our life so that we know the Yehovah is with us. It came to be when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Ardain with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people and all those bearing the Ark came to the Ardain and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark dipped in the edge of the water now the Yardane overflows all its banks during all the time of harvest. The waters which came down from upstream stood still. We're going to see this a few times in the life of Joshua. 
these signs and wonders which take place. Okay, here it's the waters which are standing still. They rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city uh, that is beside Sarathan. And the waters going down into the Sea of Arafat, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. And the people passed over opposite Yericho. So by this supernatural, for want of a better word, work, you know that Yehovah is with you. Because this is impossible. This is not the normal way of being. So when you come to encounter enemies and things in your life that need to be overcome, that you're not going to be able to do on your own, do not fear, be strong, and of good courage, be amats, because Yehovah is with you. The priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of Yehovah stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Ardain, and all Yisrael passed over on dry ground until all the nation had completely passed over the Ardain. So this should remind us, of course, of another time when salvation has been brought by Yehovah when they have been delivered from their enemies and it says that Israel went through on dry ground. Second Kings 2, 7 to 14 is yet another time when the waters were separated and Israel, in this case Elijah and Elisha, went through on dry ground. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Ardain. And Eliyahu took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water, and it was divided this way and that, so that the two of them passed over again on dry ground. In this case, it's also the Jordan which is being um, divided. Later in that chapter... Eliyahu, uh, the mantle of Eliyahu is taken up by Elisha, went back, he stood by the bank of the Ardain, and he took the mantle of Eliyahu that had fallen from him, and he struck the water. Okay, not Eliyahu this time. Where is Yehovah Elohim of Eliyahu? And he struck the water, and it was divided this way, and that, and Elisha passed over. So it seems in this case as well, we've got, Eliyahu, who does these great works, by him dividing the Jordan and they pass through. Of course, Elisha knows that Yehovah is with Eliyahu. But afterwards, when he's taken up into the whirlwind, into the sky, he takes his mantle and then he comes to the water and he tries to divide it and the water is divided. And he knows that Yehovah is with him also. In Mark 16, verse 20, it says, And they went out, and they proclaimed it everywhere, the good news, the gospel, while the master worked with them and confirmed the word through the accompanying signs to show that he was with them. Amen. In Joshua 3, verse 5, Yahushua said to the people, Set yourselves apart, for tomorrow Yehovah is doing wonders in your midst. Again, it's the same thing. So the first time that we see this sort of activity is of course when the Red Sea was parted and Israel went over before their enemies and then Yehovah delivered them from their enemies. They were in a situation where they were going to be overcome by the enemy. If Yehovah hadn't intervened, they would have been overcome situation where they were facing death. Yehovah brings salvation to them. He saves them from death into life and he delivers them from their enemies and in fact he destroys their enemies. Another part of the gospel. So comparing these two events. Okay, in Exodus 14, Moshe said, don't fear, stand still, see the salvation or the deliverance of Yehovah. He will destroy the Egyptians he will fight for you. Joshua said, He shall destroy the inhabitants. You shall know that the living Elohim is among you. Exodus 14, the Red Sea. Yehovah told Moshe ahead of time what would happen. The angel of Yehovah and the pillar of cloud went before them. 
went behind them. Sorry, the pillar of cloud that went before them went behind them. And Joshua, Joshua told the people ahead of time what would happen again. And the Ark of the Covenant this time is what is going before them. Exodus 14, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. Yehovah turned the sea into dry land. The waters were divided. Yisrael went into the midst of the Red Sea on dry land. The water was a heap on the left and on the right. In Joshua, the priest's feet dipped into the edge of the Jordan. The water split. The people crossed over on dry ground. The priests stood on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. In Exodus, Yehovah commanded Moshe what to do so that the water would return. In Joshua, Yehovah commands Joshua what to do so the water would return. Moshe stretched out his hand over the sea and the water returned. In Joshua, as the priest's feet, okay, so it's Moshe's hand both times um, at the Red Sea. This time it's the priest's feet. As the priest's feet touched the dry ground, the water returned. The waters heaped up, the deep congealed. People of Israel walked over on dry ground. Joshua, tell your children, uh, tell your children Israel crossed over on dry ground. So children, Israel are both mentioned, but here it's tell your children that Israel crossed over on dry ground and that Yehovah dried up the water of the Jordan. The people heard and feared. Uh, may they fear the greatness of your mighty arm is the phrasing in Exodus 15. In Joshua 5, the Amorite and Canaanite kings heard how Yehovah dried up the Jordan's water and feared. And then the thing that it's all pointing to, okay, so we've got these two narratives which are have these uh, same elements to them. The thing that it's all pointing to, what begins after the Red Sea is that the manna begins to fall from heaven. What happens at the end of this narrative, we'll see this next week, is that the manna ceased falling from heaven. Again, tying these two narratives. In Isaiah 51, 10 to 11, it says, Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed to pass over? And this can be seen to be talking about what happened at the Red Sea. can also be seen to be talking about what happens when the redeemed leave Sheol. Let the ransomed of Yehovah return, and they shall come to Sion with singing. Okay, that's not what happened at the Red Sea. But it is what will happen when the redeemed of Yehovah, the ransomed of Yehovah, are released from Sheol. In Exodus 15, okay, this is right after they've crossed over. This is what we read. It says, people's heard, they trembled, anguish gripped the inhabitants of Philistia. Really? Well, that didn't actually happen when they were crossing the Red Sea. Then the chiefs of Edom were troubled, the mighty men of Moab, trembling grips them, all the inhabitants of Canaan melted again. This is not something that happened when they crossed the Red Sea. It's something to which will happen in the future, though, when um, the depths, the sea in Sheol, um, is made so that we can pass over it. Fear and dread fell on them. By the greatness of your arm, they are as silent as stone until your people pass over. O Yehovah, until the people whom you have brought pass over. You have bought, rather, Passover, who've been redeemed, ransomed. You bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance. That's Mount Zion. Again, that's not what happened to the people who crossed over the Red Sea, but it is prophetic of what will happen to us. And again, this is an element of salvation, an element of the good news, an element of deliverance, the enemy being vanquished. Recommend people check this out. This goes through the entire prophecy as it is in Exodus 15. Exodus 15 is a remarkable piece of scripture. It seems in parts like it's talking about what has just happened in this kind of celebration of the people as what's just happened when the Egyptians were killed. However, there's much of it 
which speaks prophetically of what happens when Yeshua leads us into Mount Sion. In Genesis 12, verse 7, okay, what we're seeing here is a fulfillment of something that happened right at the beginning of the book of Genesis. Yehovah appeared to Avram and said, To your seed I give this land. This also is part of the good news. Okay, to your seed I give this land. He built an altar to Yehovah who had appeared to him. So this promise that the land of Canaan is going to be given to Abraham's seed happened a long time ago. Genesis 26, 4-5, we hear why this promise was given to Abraham. I shall increase your seed like the stars of the heavens, and I shall give all these lands to your seed. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. This is the part of the good news, which is the Gentiles coming to Yehovah. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and cherished my charge, my commands, my laws, and my Torah. This is why the promise was given to Abraham, and this is why the promise will, you are willing, be given to us if we make this true of ourselves. In John 8, 31 to 39, Yeshua said to those Jews who believed him, if you stay in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we're the seed of Abraham, and we've been servants to no one at any time. How do you say you shall become free? Yeshua answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who is doing sin is a servant of sin. And the servant does not stay in the house forever, but a son stays forever. If then the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are the seed of Abraham, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I've seen with my father. You do what you've heard from your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Yeshua said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. So this promise of the land is given to Abraham's children. They said, we are Abraham's children. And he said, no, you were born of Abraham, but your father is somebody else, the one that you do the works of. You are of your father, the devil. Galatians 3, 6 to 9, we see how to be Abraham's children. Even so, Abraham did believe Elohim, and it was reckoned unto him as righteousness. Know then that those who are of belief are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, having foreseen that Elohim would declare right the Gentiles by belief, announced the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, all the nations shall be blessed in you. So that those who are of belief are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Okay, if you are of Messiah, then you are the seed of Abraham. And heirs according to the promise. So that promise that was given to Abraham, we become co-heirs, which as Paul said, is a part of the gospel. The gospel that was revealed to Abraham, the gospel that was given to these people also. First Corinthians 10, 1 to 6 tells us, it warns us about this though. The gospel was given to them, it's also been given to us. Paul says, for I do not wish you to be ignorant, brothers, that all our fathers were under the cloud, all of them passed through the sea. All of them were immersed into Moshe in the cloud and in the sea. They all undergo, underwent baptism, all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed, and the rock was Messiah. So they had everything that we had. However, with most of them, Elohim was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness, and they became examples for us, so that we should not lust after evil as those indeed lusted. So Abraham is our example. If we follow Abraham's example, we follow all of his laws, all of his charges, then we are children of Abraham. These people are also an example for us of what not to do. And the word is cyclical, happens over and over again with a different cast of characters. We are another cast of characters living out 
the word of Elohim. Joshua 4 says, It came to be when the entire nation had completely passed over the Ardain, the Yehovah spoke to Yahushua saying, Take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one man from every tribe. Command them saying, Take for yourselves 12 stones from here, out of the midst of the Ardain, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm, and you shall bring them with you and leave them in the camp in which you spent the night. Kind of strange instructions. Twelve is another one of those numbers, isn't it, that we see throughout the scriptures. Genesis 35, 22. Okay, we hear the sons of Yaakov, the twelve. Okay. See in Exodus 15, 27, we see 12 fountains of water, 70 palm trees. 70 is another one of those numbers. There are 12 fountains of water, Exodus 24, 4. 12 standing columns for the 12 tribes of Israel. Exodus 28, 21. The stones are, according to the names of the sons of Israel, 12 according to their name. That's the breastplate on the high priest. Leviticus 24, 5, you shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it, two tenths of an aphor in each cake. Revelation 7, 40, 4 to 8, I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed out the tribes of the children of Israel, the tribe of Yehuda, 12,000, Revain, 12,000, Gad, 12,000, Asher, 12,000, Naphtali, 12,000, Manasher, 12,000, Tribe of Shimon, 12,000. Levi, 12,000. Yishchah, 12,000. Zebulun, 12,000. Yosef, 12,000. Binyamin, 12,000. So we've got 12 tribes with 12,000 out of each tribe. Mark 3, verse 14. Yeshua, when he came to the earth. All of those things were appointed by Yehovah in his word. Yeshua, when he came to the earth, he appointed 12 to be with him, and he sent them out to proclaim. Matthew 14, 19 to 20. Commanding the crowds to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to the heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples and the disciples gave to the crowds. And all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up the pieces left over. How many baskets? Twelve. Revelation 21, 10 to 14, he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, showed me the great city, the set apart Yerushalayim, descending out of the heaven from Elohim. Having the esteem of Elohim and her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Having a great and high wall, having 12 gates, uh, 12 gates, 12 angels, names written on them, which are, which are those of the 12 tribes the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the 12 gates, there were 12 pearls. The city lies four-cornered. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the rod, 12,000 stadion, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. So you've got 12, 12, 12. Revelation 22, 1 to 2, he showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of Elohim and of the Lamb. In the middle of the street and on the side, either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. So we've got 12 months. We've got the 12 Chodeshim as well. So Yahovah has got something about the number 12. We've looked at the number 3 throughout this and we can identify what it is with the number 3. It seems to me when Yahovah is appointing things, when he says, I want this number of them, that we have the number 12. You'll hear all sorts of uh, ideas from people about what certain numbers mean in Scripture. And that can lead you down uh, a path that's not very good. 
you can look at the number 12 and you can look and see what's similar about them and say, well, that's similar about them. The number seven is another one. You'll get people telling you all about what the number seven means. The number seven is ubiquitous in scripture. It's probably the most commonly used number. You'll get the number eight and people saying that the number eight is all about renewal. What I would say about all of these things is I would advise caution with them all. Like with the number three, it's not always going to be about the Messiah. Be cautious when you come to these things because the place where it ultimately leads is a place that I very much have to warn you against. You may well have heard of gematria. Okay, and that's where people look for numbers in scriptures and they look for the the numeric value of the letters and then they look for words which are all made of the numeric value of the letters. And then they take that information and they layer on top of it the teachings of men and particularly the teachings of Jewish mysticism, the teachings of Kabbalah or Kabbalah. Okay, and I would very much advise you to be cautious of these things when you see things with numbers, this gematria, this Kabbalah. It's something that I've been asked about multiple times. Well, what about, that can't be true because gematria says this, and that's kind of the opposite of it. All of those things, all of mysticism and all of looking into Yehovah's word and applying on top of it a veneer of meaning which is not there, I would say be very cautious over things like that. In fact, when it comes to mysticism as a whole, do not listen to it. It's the sort of thing that kind of tickles the ear that people like to hear about. It's kind of like all the mysterious stuff where people like to peer into the word and like they like to draw out what they say is mysteries from it and secret teachings, the teachings of men. The Jewish rabbis love Kabbalah and they love Gematria. So it's good for us to note and say, number 12 seems to be a number that Yehovah seems to like. Seems to be when he appoints things, he appoints things in number. The number seven is a number which comes up a lot. The number three is a number that comes up a lot. But be very cautious of anything that goes anywhere beyond that. I actually think that probably everyone here is aware of this as dangerous um, but I, I get things from people online fairly commonly about all of this sort of stuff so I'll caution you against that verse 4 says that Yehoshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel one man from every tribe Yehoshua said to them pass over before the ark of Yehovah into the midst of the Ardain each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, so that this sign sh so that there shall be a sign in your midst. When your children ask in time to come, saying, "What do these stones mean to you?" Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Yardim were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of Yehovah when it passed over the Yardim. The waters of the Yardim were cut off. And these stones shall be for a remembrance to the children of Israel forever. Now, Yehovah is doing this isn't he? constantly throughout the Torah. He gives us things which you can visit, you, you can look at, and you can remember the things which he has done by them. The children of Israel did so as Yehoshua commanded and took up 12 stones from the midst of the Yardin as Yehovah had spoken to Yahushua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and took them over with them to the camp and laid them down there. Yahushua also set up 12 stones in the midst of the Ardain, in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there to this day. And the priests who bore the Ark stood in the midst of the Ardain until every matter was finished, the Yehovah had commanded Yahushua to speak to the people according to all that Moshe had commanded Yahushua. And the people hastened and passed over. And it came to be when all the people had passed over that the ark of Yehovah and his priests passed over in the presence of the people. 
And the sons of Reuven and the sons of Gad and the tribe of Manasseh passed over in fives before the children of Israel as Moshe had spoken to them. So this is exactly what we were reading before. You're going to pass over in fives. About 40,000 armed ones of the army passed over before Yehovah for battle to the desert plains of Yericho. On that day, Yehovah made Yehoshua great before the eyes of all Israel, and they feared him as they had feared Moshe all the days of his life. Personally, the reason that I think the number 12 is significant to Yehovah, just for whatever it's worth, is because that's how many children Jacob had. And that's how many tribes of the children of Israel there are. Often when he says 12, 12, 12, 12, it's 12 according to the number of tribes that there were. So personally, I think that that's why he likes the number 12. I won't read into that sort of stuff too much. I put this scripture in. Okay, we see here at the end that they're going over with the army. They're going into the land of Canaan and they're going to fight the people in the land of Canaan and they're going to kill them and they're going to drive them out. Okay, Yeshua says, you heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the wicked. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. And something that comes up when people are considering Yeshua's teaching is, well, what about the armies? What about King David when he went out to war with the enemies of Israel? Why is it okay for somebody to go out to war, but it's not okay for us to resist somebody wicked? It's a good question, isn't it? You notice in this example, Yeshua says, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You've heard that that was said, but I say to you, don't do it like that. What's he talking about? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth was something that was given to the judges. Okay, that's how the judges were to govern his people. Okay, if somebody does something to someone else, the same is done to them. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But Yeshua is saying, but for you guys, you don't do that. Okay, you don't take vengeance on somebody else. You don't enact that principle. That's for the judges. That's for the leaders to enact. It's the same with going to war. Yehovah puts men in leadership over his people. And he tells those men, go out to war against your enemies. So the leaders enact one principle. But for us personally, it's not a principle that we enact, just like with the judges. Joshua, David, Solomon, whoever it is that's involved in these conflicts, they're all told to do it by Yehovah. And that principle is okay for them to apply, but not for us in the same way. And she sure explains here. And Yehovah said, uh, spoke to Yehoshua, saying, Command the priests who bear the ark of the witness and let them come up from the Ardain. And Yehoshua commanded the priests, saying, Come up from the Ardain. And it came to be when the priests who bore the ark of the covenant of Yehovah had come from the midst of the Ardain. And the soles of the priest's feet touched the dry land. The waters of the Ardain returned to their place and flowed over all its banks as before. And it's interesting to consider what's happening here. Just as Moshe was going into the tent of meeting and he was meeting with Yehovah and Yehovah was telling him all of this stuff, the tabernacles also following these people around. This is where Yahushua is going and meeting with Yehovah and getting the instructions. And then he comes in the same way that Moshe did. And he's telling the people what to do. And the people came up from the Ardain on the 10th day of the first Chodesh. And they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Yericho. So this is before the manna stops. The manna stopped after Passover, which is the 14th day of the first Chodesh. Okay, so when they're told to prepare the food for three days and all of that, it's before the manna stops. This is the 10th day of the first Chodesh, which is when they were told in the Exodus that they would be taking the lamb into their houses. Those 12 stones which they took out of the Ardain, Yahushua set up in Gilgal. And he said to the children of Israel, saying, When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? 
Then you shall let your children know, saying, Yisrael passed over the, uh, the Yardane on dry land. For Yehovah your Elohim dried up the waters of the Yardane before you until you passed over, as Yehovah your Elohim did to the Sea of Reeds, which he dried up before us until we have passed over. I'm going to suggest something here. When Yehovah does things in your life, if you've got kids, that it might be a good thing to do, maybe, to memorialize that in some way and give your kids something by which they can remember that event that Yehovah did. I'm not saying that's what the t scriptures are teaching you to do. I'm just saying the scriptures, um, Yehovah gives us these things by which we can remember. It seems to me a good way that you can teach children things that Yehovah has done and ways in which they can remember it going forward throughout their lives. Yehovah speaks a lot to us, doesn't he, about us teaching our kids and about them remembering what has been done. So that all the peoples of the earth shall know that the hand shall know the hand of Yehovah, that it is strong, so that you fear Yehovah your Elohim forever. Okay, and this kind of ties into the idea that we see in Scripture about how Yehovah opens to us the doors of utterance, as the King James Version says, about how Yehovah's works go forth among the Gentiles, how we can preach the good news to people through our works and th through people around us seeing Yehovah at work in our lives. So I'll be continuing with the gospel and what Joshua teaches us about the gospel and what the gospel actually is, why we need to believe in the death and resurrection of Yeshua, how that ties into the gospel, all of those sort of things. But these will be the Joshua Torah portions going forward from this point. Okay, Torah portion today, Vayomer came to be going up to the end of Joshua 4. Charlie's Torah portion next week is called Ba'at, meaning at that time, Joshua 5 to the end of Joshua 8. Then Joshua 9 to the end of Joshua 12 is going to be Vayot Kabzu, which means and they gathered. And then all of the rest of the book of Joshua, from chapter 13 to the end of chapter 24, Charlie will be covering, covering in Torah portion, Nishara, which is It Remains. I know that Mel shared this information uh, with some people, but for those people who are watching online who like to read ahead in the Torah portions, there's the information for you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you've given us um, deliverance from our enemies and that you will be with us when times are tough and that when we are, we're worried about things, that you, um, you counsel us to remember the amazing things that you've done. I thank you that just by walking in your amazing ways that people around us see who you are and that you would use that to bring um, salvation to them as well. I thank you that we have such amazing good news that you have, um, that you've defeated death. I thank you that you became flesh and, and died on a cross for us and that you, you came and understood what it was to be human and what it was to be fearful so you could understand our weaknesses and that you would you'd care about us so much that you'd you'd do those things and that even though we're just we're dust and that we just pass away that you would um that you would value us enough to do that for us I thank you for your son and for your word I thank you that we get to be your people and we get to do all of the amazing things, the feasts and the Sabbaths, and all the amazing gifts that you've given us and that it's, it's through doing those incredible things that you bring salvation to our souls. Thank you, Father.